A very warm welcome to you to the DW World Economic Forum debate coming to you from Manila in the Philippines. This is a vibrant country spanning some 7,000 islands. And despite the natural disasters this country has endured in the past year, the people here remain warm and very optimistic. In fact, the Philippines is projected to be the highest uh, uh, growth rate country in Southeast Asia this year. The success of the Philippines is part of a larger success story of Asia, which remains the fastest growing and most dynamic region in the world. Average growth rates here are 6%. Individual countries have even more. But this is not the whole story. Income disparity is increasing. The gap between rich and poor is growing, and more and more people are struggling to make a living and often work in very dangerous and difficult circumstances. We all remember pictures from the factory collapse in Bangladesh last year. That's just one example. So the question before us today is, what kind of labor policies and practices must we have to narrow inequality, to improve social cohesion? How do we promote equitable employment. To discuss this, I have a wonderful panel with a range of expertise, and it's my great pleasure to introduce them to you now. Christophe Duchatelier is the head of Asia Pacific and Japan from ADECO. ADECO is the world's leading recruiting and staffing company. Yoshitiru Yuramoto is from the International Labor Organization, ILO. He's the assistant director general and regional director in Asia and the Pacific. Corazon Dinky Juliano Soliman from the Philippines is Secretary of Social Welfare and Development. Pierre Tami is a social entrepreneur. He is the founder of Hega International, which works with abused, exploited, and abandoned women and children. And more recently, he set up the 360 Degree Shift Initiative, which deals with youth unemployment. Takeshi Ninami is CEO of Lawson. It is the second largest chain of convenience stores in the world. He's also the co-chair of the World Economic Forum East Asia and a member of the Global Agenda Council on the Role of Business. And finally, in any labor issue, you have to have the voice of a trade union. And this important voice is represented by Christopher Ng. He is a regional director of UN, uh, UNI Global Union. A very warm welcome to all of you from me, and I invite the audience to please give the panelists a warm reception. <laughs> now, Corazon, we are in the Philippines, so I would like to start with you. Your president has a reformist, inclusive agenda. We heard wonderful things about what the country is trying to achieve, but on the ground, Things are looking quite difficult. Unemployment is high. Lots of people are marginalized. Where are things going wrong? Well, I think the first, uh, we have an unemployment rate of 7.3%. Uh, where we need more work is uh, investments uh, in the manufacturing sector and a more robust agricultural uh, economic uh, work. Uh, I say this while we know that uh, we are growing at seven point something percent, and yet we need to make sure that everyone gets the benefit. And this is why the next three years or two and a half years, the uh, target is to ensure that we actually make or bring to life what we are calling inclusive growth. And that's by way of positive action on spe spatial or spatial and sectoral growth. And that means we've identified geographical areas where poverty incidence and magnitude of the poor are high, and yet the economic potentials are high too. And that's where we want to bring in investment in the agricultural and the manufacturing sector. Now, um, Yoshi, you have lived in this region for 35 years in Asia and the Pacific. You've seen that governments often have very good programs, including the agenda that they have in the Philippines is very positive. Yet, so much still remains to be done. Where are governments here not getting their priorities right? What must they focus on? Well, um, <clears throat> now, this is 2015. Uh, next year, uh, end of it, uh, the uh, 10 ASEAN uh, 
ASEAN nations, including Philippines, getting into ASEAN economic uh, uh, community is the integration aimed for uh, the common production centers and the uh, economic integration, but under shared prosperity. So that shared prosperity means inclusive growth, you know. And then now we have in Asia, 60% uh, of the older workers in Asia is in vulnerable employment. So poverty is rampant. So on that, uh, we are already have uh, disparity. Now, when we have a disparity, now Asian economic uh, community, which we are entering at the end of 2015, our analysis, we've done a study, and the report to become shortly, say this will aggravate inequality in a community. And that's the agenda I like to, I like to see. When the solution to prevent, avoid eh, aggravating inequality there are a number of things we can do. And then there's a lot the government can play a role. Of course, the employers can do a great deal of things. But I think uh, the role of government in, the, in directing all this is a very important uh, role to play. Now, to narrow inequality and to narrow uh, income disparity, is the corporate uh, companies play a very important role. Businesses play a very important Takeshi, how do you see the role of your company and other companies like yours in dealing with inequalities and promoting equitable growth? Yes, uh, at first, uh, we have to discuss the mission of corporations. I believe the mission of a corporation is to serve for society. The corporations have to live with the society and prosper together. So in that term, I believe, uh, for example, one of the missions is to train people so that they can work efficiently and uh, instead of thinking about one single stakeholder, i.e. shareholder, we have to deal with the multi-shareholders, I mean multi-stakeholders, society first. But we corporations have to increase corporate value at the end of the day. So we have to have returns working together with the society and the community. That's the mission. It's a long-term vision. So role of business should stay with the long-term vision, not short-term. And then if the society prospers, then we can prosper. That's the mission we have to work on. In this context, employment is very important. And how to let people working together have the secure, I mean, safety of employment. That's very important. And they describe you as a CEO with a corporate conscience. And we hear some of that uh, this morning. Thank you very much for your comments. Now, Pierre, we've listened to what should be done, what needs to be done. You actually work with people who are on the margins of society in terms of employment. Tell us a little bit about what your perspective has been on working with these uh, marginalized groups uh, out in the field. Well, I think first and foremost, uh, in, in my experience, whether we work with uh, vulnerable uh, people, abused and trafficked women, or uh, youth that are unemployed today, what's most important is the, uh, uh, the uh, restoration of dignity that makes it very, very important for them. For them to get a job, for a woman that comes out from trafficking or abuse, for her to get a job is a celebration of her dignity and their entitlement to be able to be uh, living at her full potential and being able to contribute to society and therefore uh, living with hope. So that's for, for them most and for most important thing to do. However, uh, it's also wrong to be able to approach social entrepreneurship and label these people as constantly being marginalized and, be con and, and, and have this chronic marginalization or abusive background that hangs on their head because undo all the work that is being done to actually bring them out of that particular situation and bring them into equal standing as the rest of the world. Right, now one of the things that I want to get a sense of, uh, um, uh, Christoph, is that what is happening in Asia right now? We have seen a major shift in the last about 15 years or so of manufacturing from the West coming into Asia looking for cheap competitive markets uh, to produce their stuff. Why has that happened and what kind of impact has that had on labor relations in East Asia? Uh, f first, of course, Asia, it's a multitude of countries, so it's, it's not the same in all countries. But it's true that in the, in the last two, two decades, we, we've seen a shift of uh, industry 
coming from uh, Europe going to, uh, um, to East, not only Asia, also uh, Eastern Europe, but uh, of course he had um, uh, a very positive impact for Asia because it, it allows Asia to grow and grow quite fast. This is not the only reason, but this is one of the reasons. And of course, at the same time, he had a very negative impact on, on Europe because it's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons of the high unemployment in uh, Europe. Now in Europe, you have uh, some countries where you have an employment of people more than uh, 20%. And for the, your uh, generation, it's even around 50%, like Spain, Italy, or Greece. So the impact has been very, uh, very difficult. How is it going to change tomorrow? That's the, the big question. Well, what's been the impact in Asia? The movement of uh, manufacturing to Asia has also fueled, to a certain extent, prosperity in this region. Uh, sorry, I didn't get your question. Uh, what has been the impact of the shift of manufacturing to Asia? I would assume that also the fact that so much business has come to Asia has fueled prosperity in this region. It has to some extent also created uh, jobs for people here, which has fueled growth in these countries in East Asia. Yes, uh, de definitely. I think it's, uh, uh, again, uh, one of the prosperity of uh, Asia is due to that, to that shift and it's bringing a lot of people to, to work and the access to a job, as we were saying, it's a lot of things for uh, a lot of people and to, uh, to, to bring less poverty, to bring access to uh, healthcare, et cetera, and et cetera. Now, although there has brought some prosperity, Chris, this, there is also a negative impact for labor relations here by the fact what you described, they have turned companies, Western corporate multinational companies, have turned Asia into what you've described at some point as factory Asia. Tell us what your problem is with that. I, I think the problem <coughs> is, you know, many investors shifting from uh, Europe or even from the United States to Asia was capitalizing on the cheap labor and the very, very flexible environment available. So what, what has happened is that instead of contributing to the improvement of the people, they exploited the people by paying them low wages and also uh, recreating the employment and work organisations. I think there are very few employers, it's like our friend from Lawson, who believe at the end of the day, you know, the corporate have a social responsibility. Mm -hmm. and, and I think among others, this is something that is missing today. And so you see today how work are being exploited, become more flexible. So in many countries, we have more than 60% of people who are in the informal sector. Mm -hmm. And because they are in the informal sector, they do not enjoy you know, the protection of social security or stability in income. And I say that this, this situation cannot continue like this. It is like a time bomb. Mm. I, I remember last year at the Nepitol World Economic Forum, I was participating in a discussion. I used the word, you know, which is a wrong word actually, I used mm. a new form of terrorism. Mm. Because as workers become disillusioned without the expectation of security, of employment and income, they would become more desperate. So like, like it was reported today, there was demonstration yesterday against the forum. This is the symptom of uh, the frustration against globalization. So I hope you know, that uh, employers and government must rethink the globalization strategy and try to be more focused about people and to make sure that all this development benefit the people. Now, when you talked about the informal sector, I mean, the statistics are quite staggering. Yes. That in East Asia, about 50% yeah. of the labor force is in the informal sector. Yes. It's uh, almost 70% uh, in Southeast Asia. Yeah. And in South Asia, it's about 80% is in exactly. the informal sector. And in the Philippines, Corazon, yeah. it's uh, two-thirds of the labor force is in the informal sector. And what... Uh, Chris talked about providing a social component to draw these people into more formal uh, uh, arrangements of work. What is the Philippines doing there? What needs to be done in terms of policy to draw these people from the informal sector into a more formal wage relationship? Well, first of all, the first thing that we need to do is to ensure the rights and welfare of those in the informal sector are taken care of. So we do have a national convergence program for the social protection of informal workers. This is led by the Department of Labor and Employment and working together with the other national government agencies, uh, put together a package of ensuring two skills training so that they can get into the formal uh, sector, 
Second, social insurance, particularly health insurance. We have a universal coverage for uh, at least 14 million individuals right now, or families. And third, making sure that there is a capital uh, seed for uh, micro, small, and medium entrepreneurs who are in the informal sector right now with very high uh, interest rates from informal creditors, bringing them through the microcredit and uh, microfinance institutions that are managed either by civil society organization groups and or in partnership with government. Now, obviously, skilling and reskilling is a very important tool to bring in people from the informal sector uh, and provide them more opportunities. Uh, now, Pierre, you have worked, you have three uh, businesses you've set up in recent years dealing precisely with skilling people. Tell us about what your initiative is about and how successful it has been. Well, the, we're currently working at this issue, particularly with the launch this year of a culinary academy. One of the uh, biggest challenges in jobs creation is the fact that uh, any businesses have to succeed commercially, and when they look at the uh, workforce, the labor, particularly in Cambodia, very young, uh, you have a big challenge of, of, uh, of, of skills. So we're trying to intervene uh, strongly in this area by creating this academy, and how we do that, we structure it probably because of my many years in WEF, I learned about the uh, public-private partnership, getting the government at the table, getting the private sector at the table, and the civil society, and say this is, this is all our problem to try to solve these issues because each one stay at the corner and sing their song and blaming someone else that they should be doing their job. So we try this here to bring the three at the table and say this is our problem, we are going to solve it together and provide skills, particularly high-end skills, uh, how high quality. Sometimes we enter too cheap just because it's Cambodia, just because it's Afghanistan, they're poor, just do this. This just is very demoralizing and belittle the, the, the integrity and the dignity of the people. And I, as a Swiss, uh, I'm bringing in a Swiss and high-end uh, skills training in cooking to be able to lift these people up with skills so that you can go to Cambodia, run business, and we can provide a labor force that is highly trained and skilled. But it's a big challenge. So it's not just providing skills, but providing high-quality skills. Absolutely, yes. And Yoshi, one of the, the statistics which is also staggering, which we must mention, that 70% of the working poor of the world are actually in Asia. It may be the fastest growing region, but it also has a high proportion of the working poor. Now, you tell us, uh, he talks about bringing all the stakeholders to the table to discuss this. Where are we failing the people of the this region? Um, I think I just pick up uh, one of the issues that's been raised that, uh, in the manufacturing with uh, Christoph has mentioned. Uh, I just uh, visited Bangladesh. Um, it was um, about the uh, uh, 24th of April. That was a uh, uh, commemoration of the uh, Rana Plaza collapse. And the, uh, they, Bangladesh, they employ four million uh, people majorities of women from rural area are not really educated. So-called, they used to be in the informal sector, vulnerable sector. Now they got employment, four million. And the Bangladesh and, and, and export, they're getting 24 billion bucks every year from this export, second largest next to China. Of course, the working condition is rather very poor. So uh, uh, that, I think, uh, because this is now international supply chains international supply chains. The governance of international supply chains, particularly on the labor intensive, uh, uh, the, uh, the, in the industries, is, is, is rather need a lot of improvement. But you have a consumer, now there is a compliance issue, trade and compliances. The people are pushing labor, you know. For example, the uh, garment or T-shirt made in the, uh, a country with, uh, with, uh, with, with, uh, by, by workers, with the poor labor conditions. Consumer says, I don't want to buy this T-shirt, mm -hmm. but this is made out of blood, sweat, and tears, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, well, suppliers and brands get the pressure, you have to comply. So there are some compliance issues, and this is the international value chain. This is the, as I said, cheap labor, cheap labor. So I think ASEAN, including Philippines, now it, we are in transition period. We move out from, from, uh, from cheap labor, export-oriented, labor-intensive goods and services to more productive, innovative, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and based in more internal demand. Uh, 
So you're calling for more consumer awareness as well, that we should not be buying products which are perhaps not made in the perf most perfect conditions or on the backs of sweat, blood, and tears of uh, workers oh, in I, Asia? I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. Yeah, certainly. I mean, <laughs> consumer awareness is a very important element in this debate. Well, I, but also what uh, Takeshi was talking about in terms of enhancing corporate value by long-term sustainable practices, mm -hmm. you raise an important issue about women labor. And that's an issue, Takeshi, you uh, feel quite strongly about. Very few women in the labor force comparatively uh, in Japan. What needs to be done there? This is a shameful story about Japan, but I have to tell you, Japan is uh, ranked uh, below 100 in the world in terms of the uh, female participation in workforce. Philippines, number five. And uh, that means uh, uh, we, we can't... Uh, we, Japan can't uh, now provide the uh, equitable employment, especially to women. But uh, um, I think uh, a corporation has uh, its, uh, its role to increase the uh, 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 female participation in the workplace, such as how to increase the uh, environment, work environment for women, because diversity comes out of the uh, women at first, yeah. and then people from abroad. And uh, this is a huge challenge because we have the uh, strong culture of male domination. But uh, in the world, you know, who decides uh, shopping? Women, <laughs> right? So <laughs> definitely um, <laughs> bringing in more uh, uh, female workforce means uh, big return to corporations as well. At the end of the day, corporations have to make money, but it's a long-term commitment by top management, and uh, that leads to the uh, equitable employment. And uh, Prime Minister Abe is now very serious to increase the female participation. And uh, well, I think the uh, role of business as well as the role of government both work together toward the uh, equitable employment, especially in our country, Japan, definitely more women to be able to work. And I think uh, that's uh, quite a potential because uh, we've been uh, uh, under the decline of the population. Mm. And uh, I, I know there are lots of talented uh, uh, women, and we have to bring them into uh, to, 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 to contributing to the uh, economic growth. Mm -hmm. So that's very important. We have if, to learn from Philippines. Philippines. <laughs> if, I, if I can add on, on, on Japan, because I'm, I'm living in, in Japan, I think it's, uh, Japan is very specific, because Japan has a real demographic uh, issue that really the labor force is uh, decreasing very, very fast. Uh, the, 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 the statistics uh, are talking about a reduction of about 50% uh, of the labor force in, in the next 30 years. That's huge. So I think there is no other solution for Japan than bringing back women to work. Right. But they will have also to face or to uh, bring more immigrants to Japan, and it's not really easy. Where when in the, the rest of Asia, countries who don't have uh, demographic issues, they have, they have much more education issues. Education meaning education of young, but also uh, reskilling or training of the people and the workforce who are uh, actually working. Now, uh, Christopher, you uh, tell us about, you know, the, um, women are just one element of vulnerable groups in the labor force. You also have child labor, you have migrants, you have floating populations. Yes. How does one regulate for them? How does one skill them? How does one provide them with education, as what everyone here seems to be suggesting? I think most importantly is that we have to recognize you know, all this labor in whatever shape and form as labor. With that in place, then the existing legislation will then become applicable. Today, you know, these informal workers, this 70 over percent of informal workers, fall outside the definition of the standard legislation and this is the problem that we are facing and because they are outside the legislation they are not given the necessary protection and also the social security benefit i mean you can live with it for a while but it cannot be a perpetual arrangement this is why we think you know, one of the import this what they, of course you know other than exploitative employers they also are the reality of uh, you know the competitive pressures the technological mm. innovations so some of these informalization of work are actually a necessity of responding to those reality. I know many unionists will not agree with me, but I said that sometime we have to be realistic. We have to accept this as inevitable. 
So we have to work together with employers and government to see how we can strike the balance be between the industry need for competitions and the workers' need for security. I think this balance is, is an element that is missing. And do you think in this uh, balance, a minimum wage uh, across the region, across the various sectors, plays a crucial role? I, I think for a start, the minimum wage is critical because it set a so-called so, uh, safety net. And I think it is clear also, if you look at the, the financial crisis in 2008, one of the reasons is because you know, there are too much of production, too much of services, not enough of consumers. Immediately after the financial crisis in 2008, without exception, all government have stimulus package. And one of the critical factors in the stimulus package is to give money back to the citizen to purchase. And I was surprised that one year later, everybody forget about it. So now they are back to you know, business as usual. So when we argue you know, for minimum wages, it is because common sense prevailing without the consumers, there's no use producing the goods or the services. And I think this is something the ADB in their report repeatedly also mm. pointed out. But once again, I want to emphasize that this is, a solute, this is a problem that can only be solved with the close consultation between the stakeholders. There can be no, no uh, discussions about it is your responsibility, it's not mine. It has to be a collective effort. But Pierre, you are one of the people mm. who believes the minimum wage is not a very useful tool to deal with social in uh, uh, economic inequality. No, as much as I basically try to do all the best to bring poor people into the uh, uh, workforce and, and uh, assure that they are treated uh, with respect and uh, not being exploited, I believe that uh, setting a minimum wage, it's a short-term uh, solution. It's, it's like a surgery. You want to fix something from the government perspective. It's very dangerous because it can be seen as a votes, votes buying. Uh, it can be seen as a way to draw populism, to draw people towards the government. And it's an artificial measure because, like in Cambodia, is a private sector is a uh, private sector economy driven, and uh, the, the private sector, the market should regulate itself. I also come from Switzerland, where two weeks ago, being on the opposite end of, of uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> we we voted against it. I, I believe that the government market should regulate itself, and the government intervening in such a way it would skew the economy and create damages. And practically speaking, in Cambodia, you raise any of our employee uh, $10 on her salary. Everyone knows about it. She comes home at 5 or 6 o'clock in the evening. Her landlord already will raise the, uh, the rent. Mm -hmm. The place where she goes and buys her food will raise the price of rice. So in one day, that money that she got more already swallowed up. So we don't believe it is... Uh, no, so you want to add result. to that, but there's one thing that <laughs> element that I want to also bring in is the demographic dividend of this area. But first, I would like your comments on the minimum wage issue. Well, um, you see, in particularly in the, in, the, in the countries where informality is, is high and poverty rate is very high, minimum wages is to counter inequality. It counters inequality. Because a market really doesn't really functioning properly. A well, fair share of the labor is, if you don't intervene in the market, it doesn't really come true. Now, uh, it's minimum wage service serves in one interesting purposes. It's, the, uh, it's a protection of workers against the unduly low wages. There could be very low wages. There's unduly low wages. Minimum wages protect workers from that. And the second, it protects employers. It protects employers in such a way that the, uh, against unfair competition from wage dumping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Winston Churchill, a long time ago, he said that, the, uh, that uh, good employers is undercut by the bad. Mm -hmm. The bad is undercut by the worst. So this is a race to the bottom. However, this is a very vulnerable politically, highly sensitive issues mm. in every country. Yes. country in, in ASEAN, this is, if you start these issues, it's, it's going to be a high debate. Now, important thing is the wage setting mechanism. It has to represent sort of what we say, a, a, a minimum living wages. 
It has to take look after the family. It has to look after the, uh, the, the productivity, economic, uh, economic factors. And there are mechanisms. We don't intervene. Uh, Sometimes it's been decided by politically, because just before election, mm -hmm. I raised the you know, uh, wages by double. Mm -hmm. So vote me. Well, I think we should have the wage setting mechanism, and we don't intervene, as Chris, Chris says, it has to be done between workers and employers, and the government can come in. That's how you know, we just set. Yeah. However, it is, it, it is, you, the, the topic of today's discussion yeah. mm -hmm. is how labor policies you know, uh, help and avoid see, inequality. Yeah. And mm -hmm. this is, minimum wage is, is one of the minimum wages, I think. Yeah. Gosan, I want to come to you. You were a social worker and an activist, and you worked for an NGO before you joined the cabinet. So you now have this big chance to tackle inequality, and yet we discover that in the Philippines, 40 families own 76% of the GDP. That, how does one uh, deal with a statistic of that kind in a position that you have when you are Secretary of uh, Social Justice and Development? Social Welfare and Development. Sorry, I beg your pardon, <laughs> Social Welfare and Development. But uh, t two things I'd like to add first on the minimum wage, yeah. which is part of uh, creating the, uh, the, the, the change in terms of uh, power between labor and those who own uh, the corporations. The minimum wage, as already said, is actually uh, an equalizing and ensuring that in markets that are imperfect, as already said, the rights and the welfare of the laborer and their families are taken care of. So here we have a regional wage council. So it's geographic specific and it takes into consideration the situation of the area so there is no one national minimum wage so that you don't end up in the situation that our friend from Cambodia is uh, describing. Second, on the question of how do we then begin, or we have begun, the reforms so that uh, it is not a pyramid but it is an, uh, what you call a, quad, a quadrangle, mm -hmm. where we all are benefiting from inclusive growth. Education is number one. And, and, and that includes addressing the informal sector situation. So we're actually doing conditional cash transfer, where we want to keep children in school and keep them healthy. We have 4.2 million, 4 million families are benefiting from that, about 10 million children. It's an investment in the future because if you're educated, know the three R's, and has a consciousness of rights and welfare for yourself, family, and community, the chances of being abused and knowing that you should be negotiating for your fair share of the benefit of the growth, you, are, you have that capacity. You have the dignity to fight for because you know that you have that right. And the third is we really need to more and more promote multi-stakeholder dialogues. And mm -hmm. that's something that we have been, I would like to say, uh, investing a lot. Uh, the participatory processes of this government, the president was talking about, this is a participatory public where many of the policies, both in the economic and the social realm, are being discussed at the level of the village. Community-driven development, mm -hmm. Uh, grassroots particip participatory budget processes are just some of two or three programs that involve the citizens themselves. In that way, we're able to change incrementally together with the other stakeholders, including the big owners, the, 40 the four uh, 40 families. 40 families who own, engaged in uh, what I would call, instead of corporate social responsibility, it is responsible corporations. In other words, the responsible corporations is thinking about the future and not just about profits and thinking about the rest of society. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. Takeshi, one yes. of the uh, very important elements we've been talking about at various <clears throat> levels is uh, education and skilling. Who should be taking responsibility? Now, there's a model that we have in Germany where there's a two-tier education yes. system where you have academic uh, um, um, studies and you have vocational training. Yes. A lot of big companies feel that they should be involved in vocational training so that you broaden the base and you open opportunities for younger people. Is that something that you would support in your yes. company and you think 
company right. should support. In terms of education, mm -hmm. definitely that's a role of the government to, to give the opportunity. And, uh, but training, I think uh, uh, business uh, can uh, contribute to the, provide these skills. And definitely, just like uh, East Asia, uh, basically the growth uh, uh, comes from uh, cheap labor at first. But now, the, this uh, region is uh, stepping into the second stage of the growth, which means they need uh, uh, skills to other the, uh, you know, uh, not the f uh, from uh, cheap labor rented. This region has to be prepared for it, not only by the government effort, but, but also corporations. So uh, let me talk like a uh, role of businesses to provide enough skill sets to people working together. And then the, and the, the basic uh, education comes from the uh, role of government. I think that's very important and the training, all this training is very important. But at the end of the day, definitely skill gap happens. In that, in that sense, I think uh, the government has to do something for the skill gap. And uh, definitely training should be taken care of by corporations. And what if I, I, about, yeah, Christopher, yes. I wanted to ask you, because you have a very unique perspective, because you work both with employers mm. and employees. What would you uh, uh, share with us on this? Uh, so f first, I would like to have that, I think that education starts with the family. Mm. I think, again, all, all of us uh, mm. having family or kids, it's part of our um, um, uh, education system to explain to our uh, young generation the way to go to work. Um, I'm always uh, talking about a, a recent example of my son who is 14, mm -hmm. and it's part of the French educational system to bring them one week uh, uh, to know the, 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 the companies, the private sector. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a good start, and I think it's a, the sooner you can start to understand wh what is the, 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 the word of uh, private sectors, of companies, or non-profit organizations, but wh what is it, uh, what does it mean to have a job, what, what does it mean to go every day to, to work? What does it mean to, to, uh, or to talk with people, etc.? Et it's part of the family education that we can provide. Mm. Then, of course, the government yeah. have to play their role. Then uh, uh, school, college, university, etc. Then also, of course, the company. So it's true that at ADECO, doing, uh, being in the staffing and the recruiting, we have a, a special role that we are playing because we, we are, as you said, in the middle of... Uh, the companies who are looking for uh, people and the, the people who are looking for jobs. And we are providing all, time of, all kind of flexibility because I think flexibility is key also to bring and especially ma marginalized people to, to job and to work to help them. I think it's a more flexibility you have, more you, you will be able to bring more people to work. And I think this is something very important. And on the reskilling and retraining, I think also here, there is a lot to do, and we can do uh, a lot internally or externally. Right. Uh, I just want to share with you that, you know, we put this uh, uh, on the um, uh, topic of equitable employment uh, uh, on, onto the website with the hashtag um, EA growth. And within the space of about three days, we had 100,000 interactions on this hashtag EA growth. And this is just an example uh, uh, of just how much interest there is in this topic. Now, I want to turn to you, Yoshi. I want to ask you that, you know, this, this is a very important topic. Obviously, people feel very strongly about equitable growth as opposed to equal employment and equal. Uh, uh, equitable has a qualitative uh, uh, nature to the, uh, the term as opposed to equal employment. Is there a lot of competition within us in itself which is undermining equitable employment and growth? It's the opportunity. It's the, it's, it has to be given to somebody who wants a job. But the, uh, this, this trend in ASEAN growth, our study proves that the find, finding is in 2025, because of the AEC, Asian Economic Community, there'll be 14 million jobs will be created. Okay? And the GDP impact will be 8%, close to 300 billion bucks in addition to RCEP, which has been discussed, TPP and trade-related activities, it is the rosy picture. It brings the growth, it brings the GDP up uh, quite a percentage and it create, uh, create uh, employment. Asia is lucky. However, you know, the, there's a gap, skill gap, because the company 
want to be competitive. When the company wants to be competitive, they want a skilled job. Yeah. And the government and, and the big project, infrastructure, road networks, and, and all, because now it's in, it connectedness of ASEAN is an important issue. There's a high demand for skilled job mm. amongst the private sector and the public sector. That means, that means there'll be shortage of skilled labor. Where, where were we gonna fill it? The mid-level, low-level people, unless there is a special, very special training, training, employment services, skill training, we're gonna have this integration is going to aggravate, aggravate a gap, gap inequality. This is a very dangerous sign. I think we've been start seeing this year. And history has shown us whenever there's inequality, it, it, they, it, it has great potential for social and economic unrest. I mean, when you think of the Occupy movement that we saw recently, the labor unrest you've seen in India and Cambodia mm -hmm. and Bangladesh and several other countries, I want to focus a little bit on the demographic dividend of this area. Mm -hmm. The whole of the Asia-Pacific region has a fairly young population. You are working very closely now, Pierre, with young people. Is there enough focus being put on providing them with the right kind of education and the right kind of skills? No, it's uh, basically our challenge and uh, our battle right now. Cambodia is, is very different from other markets. It has, uh, sees about 300,000 young people landing the job market every year. Not only there are not enough jobs or not good well-paid jobs, but also uh, the issue is the skill. We need to come back to the skill. But here is my issue. For three years, I've come into World Economic Forum, and I hear a lot, private sector and, and government, talking about these issues, you know, particularly of skills, uh, providing high-quality skills. And uh, I've been to fantastic uh, uh, discussion, people clapping hands, particularly if a woman would say so. <laughs> but then when I, when I go home, I ask the private sector, are you willing to pay for it? And my, 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 I'm sorry to say, my experience, three years I'm trying to put together this culinary academy to provide high quality skilled people for an industry that is among the fastest growing in the region, the hospitality and tourism industry, 27%. So everyone in Phnom Penh is stealing each other's chefs. There are not enough chefs, there are not enough cooks. But you know what? No one is willing to pay. Everyone wants it. Everyone talks about it in an academic sense, in a scientific sense, from the Western perspective, which Cambodia wouldn't care less about it. But the point is, no one is willing to pay for it. And this is the challenge. If we want skilled labor, someone has to pay for it. Yeah. And, and I, I like to hear the, the gurus of employment, how, what, what recipe they can provide. Because we try to, to train 200 cooks, but I just, there is another colleague here, a social entrepreneur, is doing the same with vulnerable youth. But the point is we have 300,000 youth, Amrita, and how are we going to, to intervene effectively with impact? I think, that, Pierre, you've uh, put the, your finger on the thing. We all get together, we all talk, and we all agree we all must do everything. We must uh, have a multi-stakeholder, but what is actually done on the ground? And Corazon, you want to tell us yes. what you're doing. Uh, <clears throat> in the Philippines, uh, there is... Uh, there is an agreement between the BPO industry, the state universities and colleges, on the kind of skills that's needed, and that increased the capacity of the BPOs to absorb because we have this kind of agreement, and that's managed by the Technical Enhancement Skills Development Authority. So that's one. And we're moving in the direction of having more agreements with industry, the kind of skills that they need, and uh, working with uh, the universities, uh, state uni we have what we call the Commission on Higher Education, and that's where the TESDA, the Technical uh, Enhancement Skills Development Authority, the Commission on Higher Education, and the Department of Education, which is taking care of K, kindergarten, to uh, grade level 12. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're putting together the kind of curriculum that industry would need. And, and it's very industry specific. We've started out with BPOs, and I know that in the export processing zones, they're also trying to work this out. The challenge, I think, is really in agriculture, because we still are mm -hmm. an agriculture country, and that needs to be really worked on. Um, we're running out of time now, and I would like to kind of ask the audience to um, say a few words. But before we turn to the audience, Takeshi, you wanted to say something. Well, education is the key, but uh, mm -hmm. well, I think uh, the, uh, those growing companies, uh, 
would like to uh, train people a lot to retain good talent. So I think uh, there are lots of uh, emerging uh, uh, ideas that the you know, private sectors want to provide the training together with the government. It's not uh, you know, white and black. And definitely corporations have to participate into the uh, uh, training people. I think Pierre and Takeshi have to have a conversation after this debate is over. <laughs> because you have to find the right private sector person, I think, to help you, and you have to have the right project to support. Yes. Now, before we do that, um, I would like to ask the audience if they have any questions, any comments that they'd like to share with us. I would request that you identify yourself, and my suggestion would be to please focus the comment on a particular uh, um, panelist. Rather than saying leaving it to the whole panel to answer, we cannot get the whole panel to answer. So I will begin with this gentleman there in a grey tie. That's you. Um, wait for the mic to come and identify yourself and please ask a, a, a targeted question. Uh, thank you, madam. My name is Peter van Dijk. I work with Sinarmas Indonesia. We have 400,000 employees in Indonesia. We are one of the largest employers and we are one of the largest taxpayers. We work, as Mr. Ninami said, with a lot of schools. There were no schools, we build them. There were government has schools, we support them because we have an interest, as you rightly mentioned. Now, the informal sector is there where we need to make change. We integrate smallholders into our production because we want to produce sustainable palm oil, sustainable paper, and so on and so forth. But I don't hear from uh, Mr. Uramoto, and I don't hear, with all due respect, from the Philippine government um, uh, a proposal, a program, an idea on formalizing the economy uh, to really register every person and every business. I hear about microcredit keeping the enterprises informal. It is not formalizing them. Thank you. So that was a comment, uh, I take it, uh, or would you like a response from Yoshi or Corazon? Okay, uh, Corazon, if you want to uh, give me a brief response to that, and, and then we'll take other questions and we can... Uh... Uh, we have social protection programs that is the first step to formalize the informal sector. And that's registering them, finding out where they are, and then bringing them into the more formal sectors. But first, build their capacity to even manage uh, whatever it is that they're engaged in, in a manner that's working, dignified, and not on a mouth. Uh, a day-to-day -day type of existence. Right, this lady, the blonde lady with well, uh, a blue can shirt. I, can I answer this? Well? Sorry, uh, okay. um, okay. sure. Yoshi would like to add something. Yeah. Uh, this uh, informal sector issues is a very, very difficult job. Uh, uh, indeed, very difficult. In, the, in, in uh, this year's International Labour Conference, this is one of the topic, how we are going to inf uh, formalize informality. But even there is a reverse is taking place. Some of the formal sector are becoming informal. Yes. And that's, uh, that's also the case. Well, there is an incentive, built-in incentive, because often you don't have to pay tax, you don't have to follow the labor, core labor standards, and you don't have to pay uh, or, or much. You don't, you don't have to follow the rules, but you can profit, and all the whole profit is yours. And, uh, but at the same time, there has to be some benefit of formalizing it. What do you get if, you are, if your company SME particularly, a small and medium sized enterprises, if they are registered, the government and a system has to give incentive that this is what you're going to get if you formalize it. And uh, uh, there are some effort done in, the, in, in Vietnam for doing that. And, uh, but I think still there's a, there, there, uh, there's a long way. And I think there's a lot of things can be done. For example, migration. There is a, this ASEAN integration. You know, there's a lot of migration. But what has been agreed on migration is only eight professionals, doctors, accountants, architects, and all that. And that is less than 1% of the workforce of the entire ASEAN. So what about medium skill, low skill, when they want to migrate, when they want to do something? How can we interchange the certificate, assess the, assess the level of the skills? How do we certify them? How do we ask them in, in portability of, of those skills? So integration in Europe, people move around. And they, they have, you know, the, the, uh, somebody from Portugal with a doctor's degree can work in the other e e EU countries. But that certification is still yet to come. And if that comes, I think, uh, you know, gradually from mid-skill uh, mid level to the low, uh, low skill level, uh, you know, this, this, the whole system uh, has, to, has to be developed uh, on, the, on, on that. But I must say it's a very difficult, difficult area. 
very difficult. Thank you, Yoshi. Uh, the lady uh, with the mic in the hand. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I'm Elizabeth Hausler Strand. I'm the founder and CEO of Build Change. It's a Schwab Foundation. I'm a Schwab Foundation social entrepreneur. Um, my question is about the construction industry. Um, my dad is a bricklayer. He's a mason. He taught my sister and I how to lay bricks. So I think there's a lot of dignity in, in construction fields. But they're becoming, these kind of careers are becoming a lot less popular. And so I'm wondering what can be done to increase the dignity of construction jobs, which maybe has to do more with value. Like you say, um, everyone wants skilled professionals, but someone has to want to pay for it. And I'm also interested in, in taking that one step further and understanding what else can be done to encourage more women to join the construction sector. I was meeting with TESDA, the Philippines Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, the other day, who told me that Philippine women tend to be better welders than men. So, <laughs> so I guess my question is better directed to uh, Mr. Uramoto. Um, what can be done to increase the appeal of construction sector jobs, and what can be done to increase the number of women in those jobs? Um, if I understand your question correctly, I think the construction, as I said, mentioned before, is going to be, particularly for ASEAN countries, is going to be a booming industry yeah. because there's a lot of investment and many international financing institutions even talking about it, donors talking about it, people are talking about it, it's interconnectedness, infrastructure, infrastructure road, transportation. And, and uh, the tariff in ASEAN is almost reached over 90%, you see? So what is a trade facilitation? That if somebody wants to trade, port facility is not adequate, or the one-stop shop is not there. So you can't really facilitate trade, although tariff is very low. You know? So infrastructure, I don't think the construction workers, there will be a shortage of laborers. Shortage, shortage of skilled laborers. I tell you, we're gonna have it very soon shortage of skilled labor. Everybody wants the skilled labor. And then there'll be a shortage. What are we gonna do? You have to, either the price of the skilled labor cost is gonna shoot up like, uh, like you never unprecedented manner. And then, because skilled labor, sometimes they move around in ASEAN. But the laborers, uh, they have unprotected, they have to move around, and, 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 and mutual recognition, because basically not ASEAN level agreement, but country to country. To country. So they are dangerous, the law, law school. The women, um, I know there's a lot of you know, construction work on women. I, I, I remember India, uh, the employment generation job. You know, they have hammers and then you know, this is the, uh, the, you get 90 days uh, per year if you're employed and they give a job and get involved in the road construction. Many of them in India is women. But I think uh, uh, this is the, some redundant workforce. But in, in Asia, it's only 6% unemployment rate. 6%, but this is poor quality job. Yeah. An idea is how can we make a poor quality job a better job, yeah. decent job, for lower skilled people and including women. Women's, uh, uh, the percentage of decent job amongst the women is very low. We Thank got you, to, Yoshi. We got to I think we, uh, uh, it's a very important point that you make, and also what the ILO is behind this decent work agenda, not just work, but decent work. Uh, more questions, please. This gentleman here in the brown suit, first row, yes. Um, and can we have uh, brief questions, and may I also suggest brief answers so we can get uh, more uh, uh, people involved? I know which one is directed to. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. A race against Thank you. time. My name is Yohei. Uh, I'm Global Shippers from Tokyo, Japan. Mm -hmm. My question is, what drive the expo exploit power of women in Japan? One of my ideas, uh, you know, I asked yes. Ninami, uh, Mr. Ninami. Now one of my ideas is um, changing of the work style of men. And for example, when I was 28, I dropped out my company. Uh, I was in so huge other agency then too, but it was really hard to work in. Then at that time, my wife wanted to work in a flower shop in my local, so I dropped out my company and start my social entrepreneurship. So I want to ask to Mr. Ninami, what is the key of the, you know, exploit a woman's powers? Thanks. Well, briefly, uh, that's, uh, uh uh, 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 firm commitment of top management. And top management has to believe that uh, that will create the returns, financial results at the end of the day, but the long-term commitment. 
and the top management has to know it creates returns to corporations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Takeshi. The lady at the back talking about women. <clears throat> That's right. Rowena Domingo, I'm an entrepreneur and wife of the Secretary of Trade of the Philippines. I have ideas for the equitable employment. Um, maybe if we could uh, go back to supply and demand, we could match the graduates to the jobs. Um, we have a very young population. 23 is the average mm. of our population. And uh, this would also, I think, benefit us for the integration because we could look also at the regional. And also, I would like to say, um, in, um, we have talked, you have talked about family. Um, we are 100 million population in the Philippines. Um, I believe family would be difficult. It would be difficult to be having the values coming from the families. Um, we should have it in the schools. We should have value formation. And it should be from, the, uh, from K, as we start K to 12. It's very important. This would also integrate uh, having that um, sense of uh, not just thinking of profits, but thinking of the community and the country as a whole or the region as a whole as we integrate. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment. Uh, any more questions? The lady in the maroon. Hi, my name's Claire and I'm Head of Corporate Social Responsibility for Microsoft in Asia Pacific. Um, we identified a couple of years ago a growing challenge for young people that those under 25 are twice as likely to be unemployed. And this also affected skilled university students as well as those who are the working poor. So I have two questions. To Mr Ng, I'd like to ask what you think the opportunities are for technology to have a positive effect here. And for Mr. Dushatelia, when we talk about partnerships, we think of public-private or a civil society, we think of three points. What are the opportunities for corporates to actually come together to partner in that so it's not just a three-point partnership? We start with you, Mr. Duce. Christoph. Um. So re regarding partnership, I, I'm not sure I get completely your, 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 your question, but uh, I think um, um, we, we need to have a, a big dialogue be between uh, all of us. It's a, it's a question of what, talking to our uh, young generation, where, where, where they, they are going, what is the way they want to work, because it's changing, and so they're not going to want one job for their life. They want to have different experience, different jobs, so we need to understand that. So if we talk to them, we will understand where they want to go. At the same time, we need to talk to entrepreneurs to understand what are the, the, the new skills uh, uh, that entrepreneurs are, are looking for. If we don't talk to them, we will have a school teaching young generation completely in a different way that they want to go and that uh, uh, the, from the skills that are uh, searched by the company. So I think it's a question of dialogue. Uh, Chris? I, I think the advance of uh, technology is just that there is no stopping technology. A day will come when we literally will have no work, actually, because technology can do everything that we imagine it to be. This is why, in part, if we look at this uh, employment situation, whether it's uh, you know, the irregular employment or otherwise, the problem is the result also of the application of technology. I think we have to be more selective. At the end of the day, you know, I think there are some jobs that has to be done by human beings, service-oriented job, for example. And I think this is a discipline that has to be imposed by the entrepreneur themselves because if you don't, you know, then everybody in the name of profit, shareholders' responsibility will convert everything into using a technologically driven for the sake of generating profit. As I said earlier on, you know, if you look at today, look at uh, our friend, you know, they are filthy rich, Microsoft, you know, billions of dollars, so much so that they have to give it away, you know, in a philanthropic <laughs> way. My argument is very simple. If they make less profit, then there's no need to give away. 
I mean, it's, it's, I know it's, it's not uh, logical, but I think it don't make sense, you know, if you make so much of profit until the people have no job, and then you start giving away the money. So I think a balance has to be, there must be a balance. And I don't think it's wrong. We're not saying that we should not use technology. We're saying that you have to use it in a very careful manner so that it contributes to humanity rather than what we are seeing today. So I, I, yeah, this is my opinion about it. Thank you. We're running out of time now, so I'm going to uh, let two more questions in before we start ending up. So we have two ladies, the lady in the white outfit here and then the lady with the scarf at the back. Hi, I'm Mary from Asian Journal Newspaper. It's a Filipino-American newspaper in the States. Um, I'd like to ask Ms. Stinky regarding how the government decides on the location for resettlement for illegal settlers? I mean, do they take into consideration the employment opportunities in that area? Yes. Uh, first, the consideration of it's a safe area. This is for uh, communities that were resettling because they are in hazardous areas. If they are informal settlers in highly urbanized centers, also maybe in danger areas, they're resettled in safe areas. Second, if there is no livelihood opportunity there, we create. Because we do know, and experience has told us, that those that we have resettled and there are no employment or livelihood, they all come back here and they stay on the sidewalks because they don't have any more places to go back to. So yes, it's very important that we either create or ensure that the situation, local government units and private sector in that area are coming in with investments for jobs. And before we go to the final question, I just want to remind you once again that if you'd like to leave your thoughts, uh, you can write to hashtag EA growth and be part of the conversation on equitable growth. And we now go to our final question of the session, the lady with the scarf at the back. Hi, my name is Misa Matsuzaki. I'm from Japan. Um, I've been running my own business since my age of 26, been 16 years. And um, fortunately, this doesn't uh, contribute to the ranking of Japan. <laughs> okay, my question is to Mr. Ninami. Um, in terms of uh, employment policy, I understand that as Mr. Tami uh, said, um, they should not be exploited or abused. But when you look at Japan, we are the third largest economy, and we have our mature employment systems, policies. And mature means, in other words, extreme. So for the enterprise point of view, it's sometimes difficult to cope with that. There's no flexibility. So my question to Mr. Minami is, where do you think the comfort zone for employees and employment, uh, sorry, employers, sorry? Well, we've been discussing how to be able to, to ask uh, people to leave. We, we call them uh, dead words. But uh, um, I think before talking about how to ask people to leave, we have to create more ventures, business opportunities. Then we have to create the job mobility. That's very important. And if you have the more job mobility, then you can ask people because people can find jobs. But before then, you should ask corporations, what did you do in terms of training? And I think the skill comes from corporations, I believe, and the basic education comes from government. And I think uh, that kind of uh, social responsibility to be taken by corporations before talking about uh, firing people. That's my policy. Thank you, Takeshi. Um, before I conclude this session, I'm going to give Pierre 30 seconds to make a final comment. Uh, everybody's had their say. I would like you to say just a few, yes, uh, 30 seconds to say a final comment, and then I'll conclude the session. Well, my final comment is uh, we need to continue to work hard on it. I still believe that public-private partnership is the way to go. Cambodia will be the first one uh, to have uh, this particular project. We need to be more pragmatic. Uh, if we want people to earn more money in, in our industry, then don't complain you charge 5% service, service fees <laughs> and leave a, a, a big tip. That's the way you raise uh, the salaries of our staff. Don't vote for it, pay for it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
Now, it's often said that Asia's greatest asset is its human capital. And if we don't protect this capital, we don't allow it to flourish to its full potential, it could have profound implications, not just for the people themselves, but also for the region's economic prosperity. And it's very important not to have just economic growth, but it has to be accompanied by social progress. I thank all of you very much for being with us. Please join me in thanking the panel for their excellent contributions. The audience here. And also, thank you to all of you who are watching wherever you may be. You were watching the DW World Economic Forum debate coming to you from Manila in the Philippines. I'm Amrita Chima. Great to have you with us. Thank you.